That's Nick. And that's Joseph, and today we're here to talk about Disappearance at Clifton Hill, which opens uh, February 28th, 2020, courtesy of IFC Films. Uh, premiered at the 2019 Toronto International Film Festival, and it is a Canadian production. This just made me think that Clifton's Republic in downtown LA has reopened. Oh, they have? But they're not serving food still. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's so, true. Yeah. That is sad. Mm. Anyway, so this film is directed by... Albert Shin. What has Excuse Albert me. done? Uh, two other films I haven't seen. Okay. Um, this film is about a woman who recalls a memory from 25 years prior of witnessing a young man being abducted. Mm -hmm. A boy. A boy. Uh, so she decides to investigate like on her own because she thinks she might be able to solve like what happened to this boy. That's basically it. Yeah, that's basically it. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but what leads her to that is, you know, she's kind of escaping from her own life and we're, incre we're led to... She has a lot of baggage. There's a lot of baggage, in, in which gives the film a lot of unnecessary baggage. Well, we should talk about some of that baggage, but I think f let's start first with what, I, what we liked about it. <laughs> I, I love the ambiance. Um, yes. Yeah, the feel of the film is kind of a, a, a weirdo little neo-noir kind of. Um, or it also reminded me of uh, kind of offbeat indie horror films from the 70s as well. Yes, the ambiance really worked for me. There were several moments where I felt like, I even said to you, like, where I'd want to, like, I want to be there. Because it's set in Niagara Falls. Yeah, yeah. it just, like, it, it, like, it's done so, so well. Um, it has a very quirky feel to it. Um, there's, like, quite a bit of use of, like, neon colors mm -hmm. that I really liked. So yeah, the ambiance is great. And I think that's about it for me. The story really bothered me. The, sto the story has some really good elements to it. Um, so reading the initial, like the basic synopsis, I thought this film might have played out like a Dark Waters. That Mark Ruffalo film about the- The Todd Haynes film, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was a little disappointed to realize that like it's pretty convoluted and the dots don't connect very well no, even in the end when there's like actual like an actual news report that explains kind of everything it's i still am left like as i'm sitting here not a hundred percent sure what happened there's a lot going on and you know it has some it, you know what it, to add to what i liked it has some kind of Lynchian elements about it for sure uh, that, that, that you can see where Shin's influences are coming from a little bit But I, but that I really liked um, yes mm. But it's not weird enough to justify it not so like, you know I'm not as big of a fan of David Lynch's work as you are, but I recognize that um, His style is lauded by people and and what does make sense to me is that it is so offbeat and weird that it makes sense that it doesn't make sense to me right, but this film is like it's not that um, abstract that it shouldn't make sense. <laughs> no, it, I, I just think it's a function of the storytelling yeah. and the writing. So the star of the film is... Tuppence Middleton. Who... She reminded me of Rooney Mara a bit. Like, yeah, as an actor, I think she's cool. But, but she's, she's, of course, in Sense8, the, the Wachowski siblings uh, series, and uh, she's in Downton Abbey. Her characterization which is due to the writing didn't work for me because she's supposed to seem kind of like unhinged but she's playing it like she's just like this smarmy bratty person who doesn't seem to understand how the world works or i think she did need to seem more unhinged than this woman appears to be yes yeah, yeah. um her sister is played by who i thought was um <sighs> I probably shouldn't even say it because I'm just being mean. What the woman who plays her sister? I don't remember who you said it. You thought it was. I thought she. Well, I thought she looked quite mature, so I thought it was John Travolta's wife. <laughs> you thought it was Kelly Preston. That's right. <laughs> but it's not. Because I'm like, oh, her sister is much older than her, but I guess she's not. No, Hannah Gross is yes. uh, who, who I know from. She plays uh, the young version of Frances Conroy in Joker, the mom. Sure. In the flashbacks and Mindhunter, the David Fincher series. Yes. She's the one who wants to go to med school. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So sorry to this woman. But um, she, I, I think her characterization works the best for me because she's as frustrated as her, as her sister is with the main character. That's how I felt watching the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like you don't make sense. You're not explaining yourself well. What is happening here? Why do you even care? Your life is in shambles and you're worried about some boy who was abducted 25 years ago mm -hmm. who 
that case has been ruled a suicide. So it's like, maybe you need to focus on yourself. So I thought that characterization played by her was the best. Like that, the writing of that character makes the most sense to me. Um, the main character's brother-in-law is played by um, the guy from Schitt's Creek, Noah, Noah Reed, Reed mm -hmm. who I like, but he had nothing to do really. Correct. Um, David Cronenberg. David Cronenberg, who's I know is a big deal. He's a very big deal, He's yes. Big deal. Mm -hmm. And he has a really great voice. He does? He plays kind of like a quackpot, like, he has like a podcast. He's a conspiracy theorist. A quackpot? I was it's crackpot. Crack quackpot. I was thinking quack doctor and crackpot. He's like a conspiracy theorist who. So the sort of the background of this film is that they're in this like border town in Canada, and the lore of this town is that there's this family, like super rich family that owns everything, and generationally like the grandfather, the father, and the son, um, who all have the same name, Charles something. Mm -hmm. um, the youngest, who's like currently reigning, we are led to believe that he may be like a pedophile and perhaps the missing boy is linked to him and there are other missing boys according to David Cronenberg's character who might have been, uh, you know, mm -hmm. affiliated with, affiliated with family, this yeah. family. So that's very interesting, right? Like obviously this is like, oh, this could be a really good episode of Dateline, but it it not, doesn't connect like nothing well and then plus and also you, david cronenberg i thought like i know he's a big deal and i do like his voice but i didn't think he was a good actor <laughs> he was in clive barker's nightbreed okay well but yeah yeah you know. well i was at target yesterday okay what does that have to do with anything but <laughs> i'm just saying he's been in films no I, I know he's a big deal and i do he has a great presence like he he I think he was well utilized in this film yeah. because he's talking, he's narrating and he's doing a podcast. Mm -hmm. So his voice works perfectly. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I guess if you can get someone like him in your film, like you would do it. Um, but yeah, the biggest thing is the story. I, I, I don't understand the story. Like we both watched it and putting everything we know together. I still don't know if I understand what happened. Well, and then, or really care by the end of it either too. Like I think if it could have been much more streamlined and it, it didn't need all of that excess baggage. Because right? there, so speaking of positive things, there is, there are a couple of scenes that really work well and they involve, so this missing boy is tied to this rich family who's also tied to like this magician couple. The, the magnificent Mulans. Mulans. And a woman who worked for them is like a tight, like an animal trainer named Bev Mole. So there's a scene where um, the main character, Abby, mm -hmm. she like tricks Bev Mole into coming to her hotel mm -hmm. because she wants to like, spy on her and get more information. And there's a scene where she breaks into her hotel room because Abby owns the hotel this woman's staying in. Or used to. Used also to. Also a plot point. That's a plot point. Yeah. Um, she creeps into her room, discovers um, that her husband, who's in a wheelchair, knows more than he's said, and that was a really creepy scene yeah. and really well done. I kind of felt like the first 35 to 40 minutes of the film is kind of building on the fact that Abby is not stable and like a loose cannon, and I don't think I needed that. I think we could have started with the opening scene, which was really good, of her as a seven-year-old witnessing this abduction, and then fast forward to her sort of you know, we get a little sense of who she is, but I think the main focus should have been her investigating this disappearance and how it all pieces together. I don't need to know that she's like unstable because she's really unlikable. So like and you said- pull, And pulled this nonsensical stunt in Phoenix. And pulled multiple, like, okay. So then let's just talk about all the things don't make sense <laughs> with the story. Okay. So Abby's like, there's some contention between her and her sister because obviously Abby is like, unstable and a big portion of that is that she did a stint in phoenix for some time where she was with a man and apparently she had retrograde amnesia yeah went through this whole thing created like all this these problems so she was deported back to canada so she's not allowed in the u.s so that's a, like a thing and then because of that their mother who owned the hotel had to borrow money against the hotel to pay for all of abby's legal fees which the sister didn't know and the mom hid from her because she thought that would cause tension, but there already is tension. Right. And so. then the mom has to sell the property to the rich family, the guy who may be a pedophile. So that's all tied together. They all are still in the same small town. She has a one night stand with a cop 
who ends up being the same cop she goes to when she wants to report this abduction that's 25 years past. Like, so many things. Uh -huh. Even the... And then the backstory of, like, the magician and the animal trainer and how that all ties together was very convoluted. It is, but I, you know... I, it was very interesting had that been flushed out more. And then also uh, French-Canadian... Famous French Canadian actress Marie Jose. Croce. She was also a bright spot. Like yeah. her portrayal is very campy and over the top. Yeah, it just didn't belong in this film. Like I felt like she belonged in a David Lynch film. Yes, but and, she or this film could have like taken her tone and made the film more like that. But I, you know, usually I, she I don't really care for her as much because she's in very um, art housey Canadian cinema, like by Denis Villeneuve and Denis Arcand, like. The, barbar the Barbarian Invasions, which I think made her famous, like that, okay. is not a film I like. But, um, yeah, so this was a different way to see her. As well. There were some, there's a lot of, like, potential here, and because I like the vibe of the film and the look of it, and there are some features that really do work. I just think the writing got out of hand. Like, they needed to edit some of this script. Yeah. Take out a lot of the baggage and just make it, like... I mean, any episode of Dateline is more thrilling and engaging than this film was. Even the bad ones. Oh boy. Even the 21 minute ones. I, I, there, Even the throwaway episodes of Dateline were more interesting than this film. It has some things going for it. Uh, but yeah, it, it just felt like it could have been so much better. What would you give it? Two and a half out of five. I would give it two out of five stars. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm.